In this video, I'm going to introduce you to the portfolio management process. If you're studying for the first CFA exam, you'll notice that I'm following very closely to the framework identified by the CFA Institute. That's by design. I'll start off with a bird's eye view of the process, and then I'll discuss the basics and the parts of the IPS. Finally, I'll go into detail on several investment techniques and parts of the portfolio management process. Many funds follow a straightforward process of planning, execution, and feedback. This process is iterative and should restart each period, whether that's, let's say, a quarter, a month, or each year. The planning stage has several parts, such as the establishment of the Investment Policy Statement, or IPS for short. The IPS is the foundational document of the portfolio. In later periods, the IPS should be reevaluated and modified if necessary. The IPS will detail the purpose of the fund and its objectives. It will also detail the fund's constraints and other information that the manager and analysts will need when they're making investment decisions. The IPS serves as the guide for all of the fund's stakeholders and ensures that everyone knows how the fund is expected to be managed. The IPS will detail items such as the largest allowable weights for any asset in the portfolio. Mutual fund IPSs often restrict managers from holding more than 5% of the fund's assets in any one security to ensure diversification. In each period, the fund management and analysts will need to form their capital market expectations. These expectations are the expected return and volatility of each asset class. Once these are developed, it's time for the execution step. In the execution step, the fund analysts calculate the expected returns, volatilities, and correlations of each asset, determine the correct weights of each security, and then buy and sell securities. The way to assign those weights depends on the fund in question. In the final, or feedback step, you examine your performance and rebalance the portfolio. You'll often put together a quarterly report. I'll show you some examples of this both for our Student Managed Investment Fund and other funds later. What you're looking at now is a graphical representation of the process. It shows the iterative nature of the investment management process. So notice we start out with planning, and in that stage, we identify our investor objectives, the constraints, and the preferences. Uh, all of that is going to be in the IPS. Next we'll have a series of factors that are going to drive our ultimate decision making. So economic factors, social factors, political and regulatory factors. Uh, those are going to be used to build our capital market expectations. And then in the execution step, we identify our expected returns for each security, our volatility for each security, and then we try to estimate the correlation between each security because we're trying to build a diversified portfolio. And we want to make sure that our portfolio contains assets that are relatively lowly correlated with one another. And then finally, in that feedback step, we have our analysis. We examine our performance and we determine whether we met our investors' objectives. And then this entire process starts over back at the planning step. Now, please keep in mind that managers and analysts are fiduciaries. They're tasked with following the prudent investor rule, which states advisors who work with tax-advantaged retirement savings are to be held to a fiduciary standard. This means they're required to put the interests of their clients and their firm ahead of their own interests. This rule was put into place by the Department of Labor in 2016. Members of several professional societies, including the CFPs and the CFAs that operate in the U.S. and around the world, uh, were subject to this requirement prior to 2016, but now the prudent investor rule is the, the standard. Uh, in the industry. So I have an example to illustrate how important this requirement is. Let's say you're managing a client's portfolio and you're a CFA. If you've identified a stock that you think is undervalued and therefore a good buy, you're required under the fiduciary standard to let your client and your firm know about the security's valuation before you trade on that security. Whether or not your firm or your client take your advice is irrelevant you have to put their needs in front of your own. Now, let's walk through each step of the investment management process in more detail, starting with the parts of the IPS. Every IPS is different. They depend on need, type of fund, and the client. 
Some fund managers have specific requirements for distributions. However, every IPS should have at least most of these basic sections. IPSs can be developed for individual clients, mutual funds, and any other institutional fund. Let's start out with the client description. You want to know their circumstances, their, their situation, and investment objectives. If the client is an individual, you should know the assets, the liabilities, expenses, and income per period. Next, we have the statement of purpose. And the statement of purpose is often at the top of the IPS. It identifies the purpose and the reason the IPS exists and identifies what else follows in the IPS. The statement of duties and responsibilities indicates the duties of the investment manager, the custodian of assets, and the client. For a student managed investment fund or mutual fund, it might describe the responsibilities of both the manager and the analysts. The procedures part of the IPS indicates the procedures to be used to update the IPS and respond to various situations. This will most often be found in more detailed IPSs. The investment objectives will be listed both in terms of the risk and the return objective, and it'll be constructed based on your conversations with your client. The investment guidelines often describe how the analysis and the investment process will work for the fund. Next, you should include the methods you want to use to assess the fund's performance. You should also identify the benchmark you're going to be comparing your fund's performance with. And then finally, in the appendices, you'll often identify how a fund's assets will be allocated across asset classes and how you're going to rebalance the portfolio. Let's go deeper on the risk and return objectives. Both of these should be included in the IPS. Return objectives can be either relative to a benchmark or absolute. A relative return objective might be something like the return will be greater than that of the S&P 500 over the same period. An absolute return objective would list a specific target return, like 10% over the next year. The risk objective identifies the amount of risk the fund will be exposed to. You can measure this using standard deviation, VAR, or some other metric. Many funds will specify a qualitative level of risk, like specifying a moderate level or a low level of risk. However, funds can specify an absolute or a relative risk objective. For example, the fund manager might specify that the fund will have a 5% VAR of no greater than a certain loss. We'll talk about VAR later in this class. There are also many different constraints your portfolio can face that lead to investment restrictions. First, the risk tolerance should be specified. If the risk tolerance is low, your portfolio shouldn't be heavily invested in volatile securities. So this goes along with the, the risk objective. The investment horizon is also an issue. If your portfolio will be liquidated soon, then you should reduce the risk as the maturity date gets closer. Uh, so think of a 2030 target date fund. As you get closer to 2030, the goal of the fund manager should be to reduce the risk. Uh, now, your plan might also require a certain amount of liquidity. And liquidity is the ease and speed with which an asset can be sold for cash at a fair value. Some assets and asset classes are more liquid than others. For example, large cap stocks listed on U.S. exchanges are extremely liquid. On the other hand, real estate in a small market might be very illiquid. In order to sell it quickly, you might have to sell it for a significant discount. If you have liquidity requirements, there might be some markets you would want to avoid. You might also have regulatory concerns. If you're a CFA, a CFP, or let's say you manage money in certain markets, you might have to be a fiduciary. In some countries, there are fewer regulatory requirements and investors might not be subject to insider trading rules. So if you are, you're gonna be at a significant disadvantage. So CFAs, for example, they're not allowed to engage in insider trading, even if they're operating in a market where insider trading is legal. Tax considerations are also important. If your client is in a high tax bracket, it might be better to invest in tax advantage securities like municipal bonds or some other asset because, well, in the case of municipal bonds, their interest is not subject to taxation by the state. And then finally, many clients might have specific requirements like avoiding certain industries. 
Some investors don't want to invest in quote unquote sin stocks, while others want to overweight green investments, even at the expense of the return on their investment. So every client is different. You need to take that into consideration. Now let's take a look at different constraints faced by different types of investors. I have here six types of investors listed. Individuals, banks, endowments. Essentially, these are some of our, our largest groups of investors. And all of them have, well, relatively different requirements. So different risk tolerances, different investment horizons, liquidity needs, income needs. Uh, all of these are going to be slightly different. And so depending on who you're managing money on behalf of, your investment strategy is going to have to be different. So let's start off with individuals. I mean, every individual is different. So this is easily the most diverse set of investor constraints on the list. Uh, but if I go over to, let's say banks, banks have a very, very low risk tolerance. They tend to be highly levered. And so they don't want to invest in any assets that are extremely risky. They tend to have very short investment time horizons and they have very high liquidity needs. Uh, so in other words, if you're managing a portfolio for a bank, you're going to typically want to avoid investing in very, very risky securities like uh, small cap equities that are traded in, let's say, an emerging market. Now let's take a look at endowments. So an endowment can be set up by many different organizations. I'll stick to university endowments. So a university endowment is a fund that can be invested in all kinds of assets. Uh, couple years ago, this is probably a couple decades ago at this point, but several Ivy League schools started recognizing that their investment horizon was extremely long because, hey, it's a university endowment. This thing does not have a maturity date. And so what several Ivy League schools started doing was investing in assets that had a very long time horizon and very low liquidity. Uh, the benefit there is that the expected return should be fairly high uh, because, well, it's it's very, very risky. It should come with a very high return. So a lot of university endowments have started to invest in private equity in addition to public equity because they don't need the funds at any point in the near future. They can also take on a very high level of risk. So that means they, they have pretty high risk tolerance. Now let's talk about mutual funds. So again, mutual funds like individuals, uh, there's all kinds of requirements for these. Uh, it all depends on the type of investor that the mutual fund is trying to attract. So if you're looking at, let's say, a mutual fund whose objective is capital appreciation, uh, they might take a moderate risk, have a moderate risk tolerance and a, a long time horizon and relatively low liquidity needs. Uh, if you're looking at, let's say, a mutual fund that invests in bonds, then you might have a, a fairly low risk tolerance. I'll leave it at that. All these are different. Now let's finish up our discussion of these in investor classes by looking at the regulations and taxes they face. So individuals out of all these different groups, they tend to be subject to the fewest number of regulations and the taxes that individuals face are highly variable. If you're investing for over a year, you're going to be subject to the long-term capital gains tax rate as opposed to your ordinary income tax rate, for example. Uh, but it'll depend on uh, whether you're actually in a uh, high tax bracket. If you're not, well, chances are you're not going to pay uh, taxes on your capital gains. Uh, banks, they tend to come with fairly few regulations in terms of how they invest. Uh, endowments are guided by ERISA. Uh, the insurance industry, that's an incredibly complex industry. It's governed at the state level primarily. And so every state is going to be different. And so insurance companies, they have a huge number of regulations that they face when investing. Mutual funds, very few regulations. Uh, one of them is that you have to report your holdings and your performance quarterly or at the end of the quarter. But, you know, they're relative to some of these others, like in insurance companies, they face relatively few restrictions. And then finally, defined benefit pensions, they, they tend to face uh, uh, changing regulations uh, every few years. So I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, most of the funds we're going to look at
in this class are going to be mutual funds. We'll look at some endowments. We'll look at uh, some uh, individual investors and their investments, but uh, I, I'm going to not really dive too deeply into defined benefit pensions. All right, now that you know the basics of IPSs, let's take a look at a few examples of IPSs for mutual funds. We'll start with the T. Rowe Price Midcap Value Fund. Uh, so just as a side note, if you go to any of these fund families' websites, you can typically find all their prospectuses, some fact sheets, and their historical performance. Now, for this first fund, if you go over to Prospectus, you can download the fund's prospectus, and that's what I've done here. So we have a supplement to the prospectus at the beginning, and notice that this fund has several share classes. Now, if I scroll down here, we're going to get the table of contents, and if I keep going, now you, now you can see the investment objective of this fund. So the fund seeks to provide long-term capital appreciation by investing in primarily mid-sized companies that appear to be undervalued, uh, an admirable objective. Uh, we know some information about their fees, and then we have information on their risks, their investment strategies, etc. cetera. Uh, so this is a fairly standard IPS. It has almost every single piece of uh, information that we would want in an IPS. If I go over to one of the other links that I had on that PowerPoint slide, we'll be able to take a look at this Green Century Fund, their balanced fund. And right on their, their website, you can get a sense of the information that would be in their prospectus. So the balanced fund keeps your dollars out of fossil fuel companies and instead seeks to invest in sustainable companies and environmental innovators. So essentially, it's a fund that is avoiding investment in, well, certain industries. Uh, we'll talk about that type of investing later on in this video. But the objective here, capital growth and income from a diversified portfolio of stocks and bonds, which meet this organization standards for environmental responsibility. We have some information as to how it's going to allocate its assets. And then if I go down even further, you can see it, the breakdown of the fund's portfolio as of, well, the end of the, the last quarter for which we have data. If I keep going, you'll see some other information like information on their portfolio managers and that should give us a sense of the quality of management here. We'll also get some performance metrics. So how has this fund done over the last 10 years, over the last one year, last quarter, etc. Now in that last fund prospectus or on their website, you might have noticed that the fund specifically identified the range of weights that it would allocate to certain assets. And that asset allocation decision is a major decision in portfolio management. We need to determine how much, or rather what percentage of our portfolio, what weight we assign to each asset class in a given period. Uh, as I've already noted, many funds typically have minimum and maximum weights for each asset class. And to determine the exact amount you need to allocate to each asset class, you need to specify your capital market expectations for each market and each asset class in which you want to invest. From those, you can estimate your expected returns and derive your most efficient portfolio. The modern portfolio theory we'll cover in this class assigns an exact weight to each asset class and security but the amount you actually invest could differ from this calculated ideal amount. Now, there's several ways to estimate the expected returns for each asset class. Unfortunately, they all have issues. I've listed the techniques most often used here in this PowerPoint slide. First off, you could use macroeconomic data like investor sentiment surveys or expected GDP growth to create a best guess of economic performance. You could also build your own risk premium prediction model. There are many of these already in existence. The models developed by Goyal and Welch 2008 and then Rapash and Goyal 2008 are two of many examples. Next, you could also assume that the historical returns are indicative of future returns, which obviously is a dicey prospect. 
However, certain markets have specific factors that are not easily quantifiable, such as a strong rule of law or good shareholder rights. These factors make the market a more attractive place to invest and can lead to more innovation in the market and greater future returns. This is one of the reasons why so many international investors tend to invest in the U.S. and Western European nations. They have a very, very strong rule of law and very good shareholder rights. You're less likely to have your assets appropriated by some authority or lose them due to some, some horribly written law. Now, finally, you could collect expectations data from an analyst or another investor. For example, many large financial institutions will put out their expectations of future economic performance. However, when in doubt, it's always best to use your own analysis. Uh, if you'd like to see a, an example of a financial institution that puts out their expectations for future market conditions, Here's an example. Merrill Lynch has posted this on December 13th of 2021, and you can read the entire document uh, here. If you'd like to read it, obviously, please feel free to click the link, but it does give some indication as to what the analysts at Merrill Lynch believe will be the performance of markets in 2022. Now, once you've assigned your capital market expectations, it's time to assign the weights to each asset class. And to do this, we need to know our expected returns of each asset class, our standard deviations, and the correlations between each asset class. Uh, now, we can use techniques from modern portfolio theory to do this, and we will be doing that later in this class. But suffice it to say, we typically want to use a, a spreadsheet manager or some more complicated or advanced tool to perform this calculation. Your asset allocation decision or the decision of how much to assign to each asset class is not the only decision you need to make either. Uh, inside of each asset class, there are almost certainly going to be many different securities in which you can invest. If you analyze these securities using the techniques of security selection and find a few securities that you believe are undervalued, you might want to invest more in those securities for a short period of time. This technique is referred to as tactical asset allocation, and it's very common in actively managed funds. So just to reiterate, essentially, if you identify undervalued securities, you invest more or a larger weight of your portfolio in those undervalued securities. That's tactical asset allocation. There are also a host of other investment approaches and definitions you should know about, and here comes a list. So let's start off with core satellite approach or the core satellite approach. Uh, in this approach, an investor will invest most of their assets in a passive index or rather a passive ETF or mutual fund, and they'll invest the remainder in an actively managed portfolio based on their own analysis. I've used this approach personally over, for the past several years. For example, I typically have invested 75% of my assets in the S&P 500 ETF, the SPIDER or SPY is the ticker symbol, or maybe even the, the NASDAQ ETF. Uh, the remaining 25% of my portfolio is typically invested in assets or securities that I personally believe are undervalued. On occasion, I'll short a few securities or invest in options, uh, but the point of this core satellite approach is that the majority of the assets are passively managed, while a portion of the assets under management are actively managed. Next, we have factor investing. And factor investing involves exposing your portfolio to various factors, such as the value factor or the size factor. This approach assumes that there are factors in addition to the market risk premium that can't be diversified away, and therefore exposure to those factors should require additional compensation in the form of a return. For example, if you expose your portfolio to more liquidity risk, you should be compensated with a higher return than an investor that doesn't have any exposure to liquidity risk. Essentially, you're compensated for exposing your portfolio or individual assets in your portfolio to specific factors. Some investors use a technique called risk budgeting. And this is a technique that involves setting an overall risk limit for the portfolio. Uh, 
If one asset becomes too risky, you would reduce the weight of it in the portfolio or liquidate your position altogether. Many investors are interested in investing in assets that have good environmental, social, or governance scores, also known as ESG scores. Uh, Investors who include these ESG scores or ESG factors in their investment decision are referred to as ESG investors. You know, how original. In the last 20 years, several quantitative metrics have been developed, including by Bloomberg, to assess the ESG scores of individual firms. Some ESG investors also avoid certain firms or industries from their investment universe. For example, some investors avoid investing in quote-unquote sin stocks like alcohol distributors or tobacco manufacturers. This removal of certain stocks from the investment universe is what we typically refer to as negative screening. The opposite of negative screening is, obviously, positive screening. In this process, you invest in only assets with good ESG practices. You can screen for stocks with good ESG scores using a, sco a stock screener. We'll use that in class. Now, there are other types of ESG investing out there. Another possible type of investing is engagement investing, where you use your ownership to ensure a firm improves its ESG scores. For example, some funds will submit what are called 14A8 proposals at annual shareholder meetings to force a firm's other shareholders to vote on a particular issue. So let's take a look at one of these proposals. So this is a proposal that was brought up to a vote in Apple's shareholder meeting. So the some investors at Apple, or Apple investors, they requested that the company vote on what you're seeing right here. Uh, so if I scroll down, the proposal is this. Uh, the company shareholders are requested to vote on this specific statement. Shareholder request our board prepare a report based on a review of the BRT statement of the purpose of a corporation. All right, so what is this? Well, the BRT statement of the purpose of a corporation is a document that was discussed in 2019, uh, and it was agreed to by about 181 different CEOs, including Apple CEO. And the argument here is that a corporation shouldn't just focus on shareholder value maximization. It should show it should focus on what's called stakeholder value maximization. In other words, make decisions that are in the best interests of stakeholders as a whole, not just shareholders. So what these shareholders are proposing is that the company's shareholders, all of the shareholders at the shareholder meeting, vote on the agreement to put together a report based on the a review of the BRT statement of purpose of a corporation. So we'll see more companies doing this in the future, but this is just one of many different shareholder proposals being put forward. Now, the other approaches to investing I've just discussed, the engagement investing, the larger ESG investing, core satellite approach, factor investing, all of these are really just a small subset of the investment techniques and the constraints that investors take into account when they're making their investment decision. At a fund that relies on analysts, typically the analysts will discuss the recommendations. Uh, so an analyst will recommend a specific investment, and then that investment will be discussed and uh, be heavily scrutinized, and then the fund management will typically make the final investment decisions subject to the fund's constraints and uh, a variety of other factors. Now, after the investment decision has been made, we need to examine our performance, and we can use a variety of techniques to examine our performance. The most obvious technique is to compare our fund's performance to that of a benchmark, and we'll talk about that in a later video, but uh, we can also use a variety of other metrics like the trainer measure, Jensen's alpha, active share, and the Sharpe ratio uh, to assess our performance and compare it to the, uh, the benchmark if possible. Uh, we also do want to address any issues we can and make any other necessary adjustments. Uh, so let's say we've determined that our investment in a certain industry you know, we've invested in five securities in a particular industry. Uh, those securities are inappropriately 
uh, allocated weights in our portfolio, we would want to make that adjustment for the next period. Now, the weights of each asset in the portfolio at the end of the investment period are often going to deviate from the weights at the start of the period, since some of the securities will have had greater returns than others. So obviously, if a security has a larger return than another security, its weight over the time over the the last period will have increased relative to the weight of the security that underperformed. We need to address those deviations by rebalancing the portfolio. And rebalancing simply means readjusting portfolio weights at the end of the period to the ideal weights. Different funds will have different rebalancing procedures, and some will tend to frequently rebalance, while others will only rebalance every six months and only adjust the weights if they deviate significantly from what's ideal. Uh, this is a, there's, there's no one standard rebalancing policy. Finally, every managed fund should provide regular reports to their clients. Mutual funds provide quarterly reports. Our student managed investment fund also puts together a quarterly report. These quarterly reports indicate the portfolio holdings, the cost basis for each holding, the trades, and other important information. The quarterly report will also compare the fund's performance to that of the benchmark. So let's summarize. There are three steps in the portfolio management process, the planning step, the execution step, and the feedback step. This process is iterative and should repeat every quarter or so. Every fund should have an IPS. That IPS should detail everything from the return objectives to the constraints to the rebalancing plan. An IPS ensures that all stakeholders have the same idea of how the fund will be managed. Although it should be relatively obvious, there are many investment techniques out there. Some funds only invest in certain asset classes, while others avoid certain industries. Rebalancing plans, investment procedures, and the amount of active investment will differ across funds. All of this should be specified in the IPS. And with that, I'm going to conclude. But if you have any other questions, please feel free to reach out to me via phone or email, and I'll see you in class.